Let us pray. God, we ask your spirit to be with us, to open up our hearts, our minds, so we can receive what you have to give to us today in these scriptures, songs we sing, words that are said. Help us to know your need for who we are, your desire for who we can become. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is it that's at the core of your being, at the center of your existence? What is the central belief, the heart of who you are? Because I believe that whatever that is, it seeps out and taints everything that comes out of you. This is just Kelly's theory. And the older I get, the more theories I seem to have. I was born in 1959. Do you get five theories every decade? But in my old age, I've come to believe that if at the core of your being you are ashamed, that'll come out. A lot of times in anger, bullying, meanness. If at the core of your being you are loved and cherished, that will come out. In kindness, compassion, humility, service. Nobody is one way, all one way or the other. A lot of us are 50-50, 60-40, 80-20. In my two-year training in marriage and family therapy with the Menninger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas, when I was an associate pastor at Fremont, I offered free supervised counseling to the then Dodge County Domestic Abuse Center that had just opened up. And in one year's time, the Dodge County Domestic Abuse Center had more cases than any other in the state. And in a meeting with family after family, over time, I came to realize that especially the boys who had witnessed the abuse of their mothers or who were abused themselves, the boys had a very high likelihood of growing up to become abusers themselves. Those emotional, spiritual, physical scars and wounds left unhealed would fester and create the monster they swore they would never become. See, there is no biblical law here about washing hands before eating, but there was this requirement that the priests in the temple would wash their hands and feet before ministering at the altar. It was understood washing hands before eating holy meat from sacrifices would happen. And the Pharisees decided that all of the Hebrew nation should take seriously the command of Exodus 19 that you shall be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. So they argued that this meant that everyone should wash their hands before eating. A lot of our modern translations have difficulty translating the adjective here for hands in verse 2. The Greek word is koinos. It doesn't, itself, it doesn't really mean defiled or unclean. It's a word for common, ordinary. The Pharisees believe sh that food should be eaten with sanctified hands, not with common, ordinary hands. So it's an interesting question. Can outside rituals make us inside saints? Do clean hands make for a clean heart. To answer this, Jesus called the crowd, the crowd to his side, and with the Pharisees and the teachers looking on, he says to them, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. So dirty hands do not make a dirty heart. From within, Jesus said, not from without. 
It is greed, not grime. Malice, not money. Deceit, not dust. Arrogance, not alcohol, that makes us unclean. Water will not wash away sexual immorality. Religious rituals will not cleanse us from envy, slander, arrogance, all these evils, Jesus said, come from inside and make us unclean. Reverend David Campbell posed an interesting question. He said, would you rather have a next-door neighbor who's a person of excellent habits or a person with a good heart? Would you prefer a good friend to be somebody with excellent habits or a person with a good heart? Would you prefer a husband or a wife to be a person of excellent habits or a person with a good heart? Think about that. Which would you prefer for your child? A child with excellent habits or a child with a good heart? It's wonderful to have a neighbor who conscientiously cares for his property, respecting your property. It's wonderful to have a friend who always treats you with consideration. It's wonderful to be married to a husband who's always thoughtful and courteous or to a wife who's always gracious in her comments and deeds. It's wonderful to have a son or a daughter who shows respect and uses good manners. As wonderful as all those things are, none of them compare to having a neighbor or a friend, a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter with a good heart. When we discuss good behavior, we're discussing the quality of a person's self-control. When we discuss a good heart, we're discussing the quality of the person. This is the focus of the scripture. Pharisees and teachers have come down from Jerusalem and they're gathered around Jesus and watching his disciples. It looks like the disciples are eating lunch and they come in from the day's work and they're too tired and hungry to care about their hands and faces that are dirty and they immediately sit down to eat without washing. In fact, Jesus was saying that things cannot be unclean in any religious sense. Only persons can be really defiled. And what defiles a person is his actions, the product of his own heart. Then Jesus lists those things that come from our hearts, from the heart of persons that make them unclean. He talks about fornication and theft and murder and adultery and covetous deeds and guile and wanton wickedness and envy and slander, pride and folly. See, this morning I have a confession to make. Now you're awake. I've got a little Pharisee in me. I don't know about you. See, I didn't drink alcohol until I went to seminary. In my family, my parents, my grandparents, not drinking was something you did for God. As a child, I got that message. Consuming alcohol was against God's wishes. If you were a person of God, you didn't do it. I remember specifically my grandmother's reaction when my cousin's DUIs appeared in the Albion newspaper. They were in trouble. So I took a major hit socially in high school, being one of the non-drinking nerd group. Fortunately, I was not totally alone. Sometimes kids are. So I am the only member of Theta Chi fraternity at Nebraska Wesleyan to graduate without consuming alcohol. I think in the history of the fraternity, as far as I know. Lord knows my roommates tried. They put wood grain alcohol in my watermelon. They spiked my drinking water. You name it. My dad almost didn't let me join the fraternity when he was first walking into the fraternity house and a senior then hip in the front door and took a 12-pack of beer off his shoulder and put it on the ground to shake his hand. But seminary will stretch your mind and soul. It made me wonder if not drinking was the only thing I was doing because I believed in God. Is it what goes into you that makes you unclean or what comes out? The weird thing is, now I basically only drink 
wine around other ministers. It makes sense somehow. We call them the wild minister parties. See, human beings do need a sense of order to feel secure. We need laws to organize our communities. We need doctrines to articulate our beliefs. Order and doctrines are not bad things, but when we start to worship what gives us a sense of order or bow down to doctrine, we cease to be faithful to our Creator. And our challenge today is to recognize how we, like the Pharisees, misinterpret what is important to God what is most important. And I think it's what comes out of us. Don't get me wrong here. Jesus did not condemn the Pharisees for trying to be more godly. And I am not condemning those who abstain from alcohol. I'm just sharing my story. You might remember for 30 years, Mother Teresa worked in the slums of Calcutta in India. She worked among the most forsaken and filthy people on earth. You and I would recoil from most of the people she touched every day. The dispossessed, the downtrodden, the diseased, the desperate. The people that have been thrown in the dumpster to die. And yet everybody who met Mother Teresa talked about her warm smile that she always had. Now how after 30 years of working in conditions like that, she kept that warm smile on her face. Well, she says when she was 18 and left Yugoslavia to become a Christian servant, she said, when I was leaving home, my mother told me something very beautiful and very strange. My mom said, you go, put your hand in Jesus' hand, and walk along with him. And that's been the secret of her life ever since. See, I think we can do that. We can put our hand in Jesus' hand walk along with him. See, heart religion is translating the love of God into the love of persons, translating our worship into service, turning our religion into a way of relating in love on a day-to-day basis. And here's a good picture of that. It's an old story about former Mayor Andrew Young of Atlanta former ambassador to the United Nations in the Carter administration, talked about his experience with his youngest daughter. He said she'd always been unpredictable. The older children were exceptional students, always achieving academic honors. She made it a point just to get by. The other children focused on solid career goals. She was always wanting to be a dancer or an actress or a singer. The other children would pay homage, he said, to his stern father voice. He said, the more stern voice I used with my younger daughter, the more she just rolled her eyes. She came home one day and announced, Daddy, I'm going to Uganda to work for Habitat for Humanity. And Andrew Young was shocked. He said, do you realize Idi Amin has wrecked Uganda? Yes, she said. Do you realize that there's no real government in Uganda? She said, yes. Are you aware nobody can do anything if there's something that happens to you in Uganda? There is no recourse. She said, yes. And you still want to go? She said, I am going to Uganda. So three days later, Andrew Young, one of the most powerful men in America, stood helpless as his daughter got on a plane and flew off to Uganda. And Andrew Young said, I wanted her to be a respectable Christian, not a real one. Andrew Young's daughter taught him when it comes to following Jesus, the issue is not being respectable, but being responsible. What matters not is what the law allows you to do with your life, but what matters the most is what love demands you to do with your life. That's the essence of this heart religion that we're a part of, living out of the core of love that's there. And this communion we're about to take represents the fact that God can reach into us and touch the core of our being, our soul, and heal that part 
that's ashamed or broken or festering and start us down a different path, living more out of love than out of pain. Because see, for all of us at our core, God loves us and wants the best for us. Amen.